November is a beautiful month. It's the heart of autumn. Trees, readying themselves for a long winter nap, treat the rest of us to a magnificent display, a fireworks show of crimson and orange and gold. Fallen leaves skitter and swirl down lonely streets and across backyards. A smell of cider and bonfires hangs in the air, and the sudden chill, the sudden bite, gives it extra spice. The world seems to hold its breath for a moment, and then to heave a long sigh, sad but contented, resigned, at peace. For me, far more than New Year's, this is a time to reflect. It's a time to admit my shortcomings, but also to forgive myself and think of little ways I can improve. It's a time to step back from the hustle and stress of day-to-day -day life and remember what's really important. And it's a time to meet with my probation officer and reassure her that I'm no longer interested in setting fire to rodeo clowns. Most of all, it's a time to count my blessings. The season of Thanksgiving. For this November episode, there are two things specifically I'd like to give thanks for. The first is video games. I love video games. Almost every day I spend several hours either playing them or reading about them or talking about them or thinking about them or making videos about them. I'm passionate about games. I have been for as long as I can remember and I suspect I always will be. The second thing I want to give thanks for is comic books. Throughout my childhood and adolescence, I collected as many as I could, from reprints of the awesome Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge stories drawn by Carl Barks, to Marvel and DC superhero comics, to issues of Mad Magazine and weird, offbeat comic books. I also loved drawing my own. I spent most of my time in school creating comic strips instead of doing my schoolwork. Nowadays, I don't have as much free time or disposable income to invest in them, but I still enjoy drawing the occasional strip, or picking up a graphic novel, or dipping into the wealth of independent comics available online. Comics are awesome. Which brings me to the premise of this episode. Since my first exposure to video games was the Atari 2600, and my first exposure to comic books was superhero comics, today I'm going to combine these early influences. Here's a review of Superman for the Atari 2600. Superman for the 2600 released in 1978. It's noteworthy in that it was one of the first games ever to include a pause feature activated via the select switch on the console. Another novel aspect of the game is that you can't die. This makes sense since Superman is almost invincible, but it's also very clever game design. You're given several objectives to complete and put on a timer that just keeps counting up until you win. To excel at the game, you want to post as low a time as possible, but anyone can beat it. It's simultaneously accessible and hardcore, kind of like Kirby's Epic Yarn, only this was back in 1978. Pretty impressive. You start the game as Clark Kent on his way to the Daily Planet, but before he gets there, oh snap, Lex Luthor and his goons have blown up the Metropolis Memorial Bridge. This looks like a job for the Man of Steel. Metropolis is depicted as a series of screens, with each screen representing a city block. Your job is to recover the pieces of the bridge and to put Lex Luthor and his henchmen in jail. Luthor and his goons can't harm you, but the evil genius has released three kryptonite satellites that chase you through the city. To speed up your search and help you avoid the satellites, you can use your X-ray vision to scan adjacent screens. Once discovered, pieces of the bridge have to be reassembled and captured criminals have to be taken to jail. You can tackle these objectives in any order you like, but whatever you're doing, the satellites will pursue you. Avoid them at all costs, because if you collide with one, you'll lose the ability to fly and lift heavy objects. To regain these powers, you'll have to find Lois Lane. I guess she can somehow magically negate the effects of kryptonite? Whatever, it isn't much dumber than some of the stuff that made it into the movies. Problem is, she's a hard lady to get a hold of. She wanders all over the city. You do retain your x-ray vision in your weakened state, which makes the search a bit easier, but it's still a hassle. Unless you get lucky and bump into her right away, it will completely screw your chances of posting a good time. The instruction manual advises you to drop Lois off at the Daily Planet early in the game, so you'll know where to find her if you need her. But in my experience, she wanders away from there, too. You're better off just taking things a little slower and not running into any satellites in the first place. 
Besides the satellites, there's a helicopter that flies around, picking up and depositing objects and people at random. It fills much the same role as the bat in Adventure. Occasionally it will do something helpful, like bringing a missing piece of the bridge to you or carrying away a satellite, but most of the time it's a nuisance. It crashes satellites into you. It carries off Lois Lane when you need her. It even steals pieces of the bridge that you've already put back in place. It's a real shame the game doesn't let you use your powers to put that damn whirly gig where it belongs. Once you complete your objectives, your final task is to turn back into Clark Kent and hurry to the Daily Planet to make your report. This game can be pretty disorienting, especially the first time you play it. With all the multicolored buildings and flashing crap, you'll wonder if Superman dropped some super acid back in that phone booth. When I first played this as a kid, I had no idea what the hell was going on. I strongly advise reading the instructions. There's also a two-player co-op mode. Pretty cool for a 2600 game, huh? Actually, no. No, it's not. I'm gonna let the manual explain how it doesn't work. The player using the left joystick controller will have priority over the left and right movement of Superman, while the player using the right controller will have priority over the up and down movement of Superman. Have you ever heard a worse idea for a co-op mode? It's like two people trying to simultaneously drive the same car or put on the same pair of pants. It's ridiculous. It's so dumb I'm not even going to try it. Oh, yes, I am. Yep, it sucks. This is the kind of thing that happens when some dickhead publishing executive goes to the developers at the last possible second and says, Yeah, this is a nice game, but we want you to add a two-player mode to it. Our research shows this will sell better if it has a two-player mode. You get crap. Those complaints aside, this game is okay, especially considering that it was published back in 1978. The graphics and sound are adequate. The control is decent. The satellites and helicopter and trying to find Lois will drive you up the wall, but that's part of the fun. And it is fun, definitely worth a play. I'm giving it one thumb up out of five. Of the many 2600 games published, I only know of two that were based on comic books, the other being Spider-Man. There were some based on newspaper strips, and some based on IPs that got the comic book treatment eventually, but I believe these two were the only ones based on franchises that started as comic books. I plan to review Spider-Man in a future installment, but if anyone knows of any others that I've overlooked, drop me a comment, because I'd love to try those too. In the meantime, that's the episode. Happy Autumn, Happy November, and Happy Thanksgiving.